We were working on it. It's alive. It okay. Um, the topic of this evening's presentation is the Emory's in Bowers Harbor. Uh, I'm going to do a presentation basically from the beginning, whatever that was, up to about World War II, and then John Emory is will take over from there. And uh, kind of a uh, disclaimer, uh, as John pointed out, you have to be careful what you say about people around here because you may end up finding out you're related. <laughs> and uh, so I, I have to be careful there. I also, uh, from having done our family last year, and I found out how many mistakes I made, I, I apologize ahead of time. And uh, if you have corrections or deletions, please uh, send them by the slowest mail you possibly can. <laughs> okay, now the name of Bar Sarber, as you may know, uh, came from uh, this Bauer who was a refugee from the war up on Beaver Island. And uh, there's been write-ups on that, I think, in the little historical books that have been put out. And I know we have looked at uh, Julia Myers' books and some other ones. Uh, I was told that in 1851, the Emery's uh, basically were frozen in to Bars Harbor and they homesteaded. Now, the map I've seen, the oldest ones, show that Neonatwana Point, which is also called Tucker Point, was owned by Hiram Emery. And I'm not sure if his wife's name was Nancy because I saw Mrs. Nancy Emery in the, in the works. Now, we tried to do a little work on our genealogy. And my cousin, uh, John's sister, Kathy, uh, went out to the, I think it's the Mormons people, they have a lot of genealogy stuff, and she had no luck because nobody was there. I think she's going to follow up on that. I'll do the best I can, uh, and if any of you are related and I got it wrong, I'm sorry. All right, uh, now the electronic point in the maps was uh, listed as owned by a Hiram Emery and perhaps Nancy, that I'm not sure about. Mm -hmm. How they ended up where the boat launch is, I don't know. Because on the oldest maps, that is designated as being owned by Hannah Lay. Uh, whether they bought it, they swapped, I, I don't know. But getting to the harbor, at least the inner harbor area, and I'm, that's what I'm talking about. I'm not talking about Yanatawana or any of those other areas. And we wanted to talk about the docks and the boats. There was a doy dock there, as John pointed out to me, because uh, their style was still existed in his youth, that it was nice deep water there, and it, uh, where now the marina sets, because it's close to the shore, but it's deep. And there was also a Nielsen dock further south, and that was built on the rocks. Uh, I think those rocks had been moved out by the ice. But when I was young, and John said the same thing, that was a great place to fish for bass. And then there was the Emory dock, and um, Emory dock, you probably have seen pictures of it, and I know in, um, uh, in Myers' book there's a picture of it with the warehouse and the horse drawn uh, wagons going out there and it had the unique fact that you could drive out, slide your uh, bags of potatoes down into the uh, uh, what do I call that? The hole on the ship and then turn around and keep moving. So that was nice and wide and allowed for that to take place. Uh, now in that particular, in, Mer in Myers' book, there is a picture of the dock, and this is the same boat, this is a, a Fannie Mae Rose, which was in the, one of the last boats that the Emmys owned before, uh, that would have been Grandpa Bill, he went to work down on Hudson's where he finished up his working career. And I wanted to share a little bit about, I don't know if it was a Fannie Mae Rose or one of them, but I've seen in the literature a picture of a boat with all these deer hanging on it. And uh, I don't know if I got the story absolutely right, but like all good stories, accuracy is not the point. <laughs> uh, but uh, um, Grandpa Ed was a teetotaler, very much against drinking, and he took a, a group of uh, local, I want to say dignitaries or 
people who wanted to go up to the UP to go deer hunting, they took them up there and told them, you know, no drinking. And they went out and had a nice hunt, had all these deer hanging on the side, and they proceeded to break out the uh, bottles, and I guess they must have gotten pretty uh, uh, snookered up because when they went to bed and were sound asleep, uh, Grandpa Ed started up the engines, and when they woke up, they woke up, they were back in Bars Harbor. And he told them, go home. Uh, I guess, I don't think subtlety or tactfulness is necessarily a family trait. Uh, fishing in Bars Harbor, and John was telling me some names of people who used to do a lot of fishing down there, like Bert Kropa, Bernie uh, Elmer, and uh, the Loomis family, who actually had a business down there. And I think it was Leonard Loomis and Otto. Uh, Otto? Stewart, Stewart and Barry. Because well, I remember a Loomis driving up the driveway there in a car when I was a kid, open up the truck and there'd be a wash tub of fish there, still kind of flopping yeah. around. And that's how mom would buy fish. Uh, and so I know they did that uh, penalty. And I've also seen, if, on some of the, of the Coast Guard maps, they'll show you these little dots of what they call long stakes, where they used to hook up the gill nets. And the older maps are still on there because they wanted to make sure you didn't run into them when you were out running around in your, your boats. Uh, I found it interesting as you were talking about the summer kitchen at the Dory house because I remember uh, in Grandma Rachel's house, uh, she had a summer kitchen in the back there and she told me that's where they used to feed the crews that would work on the fish, doing the fishing. And it was a separate kitchen in the back. And that old house and somewhere, I don't know, family members, what happened to that ink, pen and ink drawing of Grandma Emery's house? I don't have to do it. Sister Nancy had it. I know, but what happened to it after that? I don't know. I've got a copy of the house. Yeah. Well, anyway, because when my sister Nancy was deceased, got that, and it was the original pen and ink. I went, this is before they were tearing it down, before the DNR tore the house down, I went in there and I took the pediments off the top of the windows, you know, because they, they had those fancy windows, and I took the pediments off and I used that to make a frame for that picture, and I was hoping to find it somewhere. I don't know what happened to it. But it was a wonderful old house. And, yes? May I ask you, where was it located? Was it right there at the dock in the harbor? The, the house was located up, you know where they have the kind of the auxiliary parking now, up on top. That's where the house was, oh, right there. Well, it was, it's it, where the parking area is down below. Then they have another auxiliary parking up on top, and the driveway up there is the old Peninsula Drive, and it's up there was where the house was located. And uh, it was a kind of a unique old house. Had lots of interesting visitors there. And my wife could contest the skunks that played in the basement while, <laughs> while she was staying there. She was there while I was away at the Army. And, uh, but one a really neat feature, and I'm a carpenter, uh, among other things, but so I kind of pay attention to uh, finished detail. Something I've never seen before. Because the stairway to go up, you, you came up two open steps, and then turned, you were inside the walls. And you got to the top and you turned to go into the upstairs and that was an open balcony. And as a kid I loved it. Get up there and play cowboys and Indians and all that kind of stuff. But that's one detail of that house that has stayed with me. And uh, along with uh, the fact of the great wonderful meals that uh, Grandma made, right? She right. was a wonderful cook. Uh, lumbering in Bars Harbor, uh, I can remember as a kid, uh, when they lumbered off Fort Island, and somewhere there was an article about that I've read, uh, and there was a large raft of logs out in the harbor, uh, almost in where the where the uh, marina is now. I remember, remember my dad took me down to the show to me because you don't see that very often, and it's right I've never seen one around here since. Uh, now with the Emerys. They had the dock, and they also had a sawmill. The, in uh, Julian Myers' is one of her books, there's a, uh, an interview or conversation between Del Whitey and Bill Rasmussen, if any of you have read it, and he talks about, as they were touring the peninsula, 
where, where there was the Emory Dock and the Emory Sawmill, and there was a creek there. That creek, the DNR moved it and they put the boat launch in, which mm. kind of messed up the drainage in the back of that swamp there to some people's not satisfaction. But apparently that creek, uh, they would bring the logs up the creek and they would uh, have that sawmill there. Now, cement foundations for the, I'm assuming it was the steam engine, still exist behind my sister's house. As I was down there today, I, there was it's a big mound there, and I thought it would really be interesting to go, go over there and tear that mound apart and to do a little excavating to see what was in there. But it's, the mound is covered with trees and birch trees and stuff. I think it'd be a lot of work, plus that I know my sister would never let me do it. Uh, now, okay, shipping. Now, when it comes to shipping, this is stuff I, I found in the library, because uh, there were lists of shippers or a list of boats and stuff like that. There was listed up in the maritime section, Captain E.T. Emery, which we assume is Ed Emery, a Captain J.W. Emery, which would have been Grandpa Bill, and a Captain Hiram Emery. And we're not too sure who was whom, but we think Hiram might have been what he referred to as Little Grandpa, because he was a, a diminutive person. And, because uh, I had heard it said that he was very small but very ambitious. He's the one who put the dock in and did, did a lot of stuff. He was just a uh, go getter. Now, from uh, the book Destination Leonor by Claudia D. Goodshout, uh, they had a, it's a book of maritime activities, and they listed three boats to J. Emery, and I'm, and I'm not sure which one that was. There was the Mermaid, the Anekma, and the Cummings. And I'm not even sure that's the same Emery, but I think it is, because it's talking about people uh, doing tours on the bay. And there were boats running all over the place back then. And uh, which I wanted to speak to that a little bit because um, it's hard today to realize just how many boats there were running around the Great Lakes. Uh, you know, we have a, the, the Chicago to Mackinac, there's 150 boats in that race or something like that. And I've been up on the island when they all came in and that. I mean, you can walk across the, the harbor there from boat to boat, there's so many of them. Well, that's only like 100 to 150 boats. And up at Pitcher Rocks, National Lakeshore in the UP, there's a memorial there, a big thing that's, I wish I would have taken a picture of it, remember the details, but it's talking about a great storm back in the late 1800s, in which like 265 boats went down to Lake Superior one night. 265 boats. That is a lot of boats. But it was literally, there were boats running all over the place just, because that was the main uh, way of transportation other than horseback or walk. And, uh, and of course, after a while, there came the railroads, and after the railroads came the semis and would buy boats. And that's why Uncle Bill ended up making cars out of the Hudson plant in Detroit, rather than uh, continuing doing the, the run below the boat line. Um, at this point, I wanted to uh, throw in another little story from the family, and I don't know how right I got this, but uh, I use this when I'm teaching with the kids. Of course, the kids love gory stories. Anything that has to do with blood, or right away, it got their attention. <laughs> and, uh, and I'm not too sure which Emory this was in file. I think it was Ed. But the story goes as I received it from my mother and other places, and I'm sure my memory has managed to enhance it with many a telling. But Grandpa Emery was apparently had taken two ships down to Chicago. I don't know if they were taking potatoes or lumber or whatever, and they dropped their load off, and they were coming back up the lake, and one of the engines calmed out, so he hooked a tow onto it. Uh, and as, as they were getting up the lake, a storm came up. And it got to the point where you could not, this was going to work. If you didn't stop towing, you were going to lose both of them. So apparently he winched the, uh, the one that was being towed up close, jumped onto the boat. And in the process of disconnecting the tow line, <coughs> caught his finger in the rope. And it tore most of his finger off. And being uh, 
a rather courageous or maybe just fugal or cheap member of our family, he took out his jackknife, opened it up, cut the finger the rest of the way off, and wrapped his finger up, and got the engine started, and got both boats saved in the port. And uh, I always thought, and when I heard that story as a kid, I thought that was great, you know? Uh, and, uh, Myself, I guess today I would have just cut the line and said goodbye, boat. But back then they didn't have insurance, I'm sure. Uh, and of course, and beside the commercial ones, the Chicago, uh, like a lot of people did, they took uh, 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 excursion boats out to the island, to the on Basil Island, to the dance hall, that kind of stuff, and other places as well as deer hunting and whatever else people wanted to do. Uh, okay, uh, that kind of brings us up to the day. I, the one thing I wanted to mention, I thought I, maybe I skipped it over here. Uh, yes, and uh, I got this out of the Grand Traverse Herald, uh, January 5th, 1888, and it said, Emery's and Sons have a new feed mill. Now, I got thinking about that and trying to figure it out, and I think what it was, and I'm guessing here a little bit, but I think it's... Uh, logical. They had a power plant there. Now, you know, they weren't cutting logs all the time, so since they had the power plant, it, no big deal to strap another big belt on or run a hammer mill. And this was in the days, now when I was a kid, most of the farmers had their own electric powered hammer mills on the farm to, you know, grind up the corn and stuff to make it into a, a, a more palatable mesh that they could mix up and give to the cows or the hogs. And, you know, I can still remember carrying this lot bucket out for the hogs. And it didn't bother me one bit when Dad got rid of the hogs. <laughs> <laughs> now, I did kind of miss the, the cows. Of course, I was a little kid, and cows were like big pets. And uh, that was, I, I kind of missed it when we got rid of the cows. Uh, did you tell your cousin you milk the horns for chocolate milk? No, my, unfortunately, all my cousins were farmers, and you couldn't pull that one out of them. <laughs> Particularly ones down, or, down in uh, Ohio, because they had a real dairy farm, where they had 40 head. And uh, so I, I couldn't pull too much on them. I've covered what I had to say, so I'm not going to let John speak to basically uh, what your life was and what you did. Yeah, I might. Now, can you hear him? No, I need to move this over. Yeah, move over. Move over. Lower a little bit. Okay. About, uh, I would like to add a little bit about uh, the uh, Emery's there and the uh, sawmill, and that was that uh, Granddad, uh, what he did at the, the sawmill was just hard, hard hardwood and what they did is they cut it up and they sold it to an uh, area in Chicago uh, manufacturer that manufactured discs in the old days. And uh, they used to not only saw it, but they used to take it down there by boat and deliver it. And one thing about the Emery's is that they always seem to continually come up with when, when one thing ran out, they'd come up with something else. Sometimes it was good, sometimes it wasn't so good. But uh, uh, when, when I came up uh, to Travers as a kid, uh, I just loved it because my granddad and I would always be fishing. He'd take me perch fishing all the time and I loved it. And then when he didn't, I was after grandma and grandma would take me. <laughs> Uh, I can always remember uh, my dad's expression, because I, I would sneak out, he'd want me to do something. And, and granddad and grandma had two rowboats down over the hill where the launching site is now, that was Emory property. And there was a path going down there. And I'd take the oars and I'd start get, try to get out of there early in the morning so I didn't have to do everything, like pump the water, there was, there was no electricity. You had to pump the water, and, and it, was a, it was quite a job for a young man, uh, a young boy. But I can always remember my dad real loud, and I only heard him do it once. 
but apparently I made too much noise with the oars and going out, sneaking out, and my dad said to my mother very loudly, he said, that, that kid of yours is never going to mount anything. All he ever does is fish. <laughs> and I, I, to, the, to this day, I'm in the fishing business. <laughs> you know? I, so uh, that, that's a story, but I always got a kick out of it because we ended up in the fishing business. But one of the reasons, my dad was a well, mechanical engineer, no, he was very successful, he had a lucrative job, he was a resident engineer. That was, uh, uh, we used to come up on, when I was just starting out as a little tiny guy, we used to come up and that's when I got fishing with grandma and fell in love with fishing. But after a while down there, I got sick, I got rheumatic fever. And it left me with the, at that time, and they were, you know, you got to remember that a long time ago, they were not up on things. And they were afraid with the rheumatic fever, I had a leaky heart valve. And uh, the doctor told my father, who was at General Motors, and I was the only boy, that it might be possible that I would not live to be too old. So my dad, uh, knowing how I love fishing, so what he did, he gave up his job at General Motors. He uh, came up, we, we had that old house that uh, Kent told you about, with the skunks underneath, and believe me, they were. Uh, uh, in fact, I got sent home, I got sent home from school. <laughs> Because my clothes reeked up. <laughs> yeah, and, and when you when you go by bus to Traverse City and, and they kick you out of school, <laughs> you know, and and I think it was I think it was Ken's mother, my aunt Jill, that came and picked me up because uh, the motor transportation wasn't there. But that that was a that was a story about living in the house. But of course. Like I said, you pump the water, you eat it on kerosene stoves. Uh, you know, it was it was a thing, but it was a it was a wonderful time when, when as a young man and coming up uh, here and starting to live on a peninsula. One thing I realized, and and I don't think anybody will, will uh, you know, not feel that this is true, but for some reason. Um, when we get, came up the peninsula, I was never accepted. You know, I, I was an outsider. I was actually bullied all the time because you got to. Uh, you, you you see me now, you think I'm a, I'm a big guy, but when I was growing up, I was just a little. I got a picture of I'm just a little tiny. Guy. But uh, it took a long time, and I mean, even some of my relations, you know, work work. They were basically, excuse me, I'm one. <laughs>